So we're talking about 21st century faith formation. What makes faith formation in 2018 different than faith formation in 1918? Or for that matter, 1995? Okay. The world around us has changed dramatically. And part of, of our challenge is how, how do we develop adaptive responses to the changes that happen around us? And every era of church history, people have done this. You develop adaptive responses. Now, there's two kinds of responses you can make. Uh, Ronald Heifetz at Harvard University uh, pioneered this kind of thinking. So on one end of the spectrum is this adaptive thinking, which is kind of creative, innovative, reimagining. The other end is what he called technical fixes. So I'll give you an example. So a, a parish is trying to get more people to, to mass on Sunday. And what they do is they play around with the mass times. And they, you know, they, well, if you offer mass here or mass here, maybe do it here. And, 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 but no, they try this over like four or five years, and no matter what they do with the mass times, the same people come. Okay. What happens oftentimes is we apply a technical fix, things we know how to do, to something that's an adaptive challenge, something we don't know how to respond to. And so Heifetz says, in our everyday life, most of the time, technical fixes, which are things we know how to do, we have the skills, the, the experience, the knowledge, work. They work really effectively. But if the environment you are in changes, you need a different response. You need an adaptive response. So parenting hasn't changed much since Adam and Eve, except that you're parenting in a different context. So there's some things about parenting that simply have not changed, and people know how to do that stuff. But now if you're a parent of children or teens, you've got to kind of manage their digital life. Well, when I was raising kids 100 years ago when dinosaurs walked the earth, <laughs> you, didn't, you worried about what? Television and how much they watched. Now, it's kind of like that on steroids. I mean, this digital life, I did a workshop for, for parents. Um, it was actually a listening session with parents uh, as part of a pr process I was doing uh, in, in the States. And um, I asked them, well, what's your number one concern? And you know, when you think about as a parent today, and I'm explaining, this was, you know, this was a city group of parents, so I was expecting a lot of things that had to do with the city. Number one, across the whole list, I had about 50, 60 parents in the room. Social media, digital life, managing my kids on the internet. That was number one, and they, once one parent said it, everybody in the room went like this. Because that's the adaptive challenge. There's nothing in the past when they were growing up that prepares them for that reality. So all the rules that they have when they were growing up, they don't apply to the digital world. The digital world creates a whole new set of challenges that they need an adaptive, creative, innovative response to. This is the situation of every religious community in Canada, the US, really around the world. How do you respond to the changes that are happening outside the church, in our people and in the world, over which you have no control? Nobody asked our permission to change the world. It would have been nice if they had asked us. We could have given some input. But these things have changed. So faith formation, parish life, has to adapt, develop adaptive responses to the world around it. I don't mean you adapt the gospel. I don't mean you adapt. You adapt the responses to the world. And so your approaches change. Your methods change. Your tools change because the world and your people have changed. So let's look at some of those. So here's the reality we were not ready for. We are not, we both, in Canada and the US, we live in 10 decade societies. It's not unusual when I do a, a, a parish program or the rest that I'll have people from peewees to oldies. And I mean oldies, 90s. I have a good friend who does intergenerational learning. And she had her first 10 decade group. She had children. The oldest person was 102 years old. Feisty. That's how she's 102 years old. You know? And said, she comes to everything in the parish, as long as somebody will bring her. She at least doesn't drive. <laughs> and she knows everybody. When she walks in the room, everybody surrounds her. 
How so when you think about faith formation, how many churches do you know are really 10-decade churches in faith formation? But we are a 10-decade society. There's a lot of people, I'm almost 68, there's a lot of people in my category, and you know who you are, baby boomers. Okay. A lot of you in that category. And if, if you get to around 70, your chances of getting to 90 are pretty darn good. How many churches have faith formation for every decade from zero to 100? But you live in a 10-decade society. People in Canada are learning, adults are learning all the time. You're a society of adult learners. Alan Tuff, who actually was at the Ontario School of Education, did a research project way back in the 70s and 80s in which he found a typical adult engaged in hundreds of adult learning projects every year, from an hour to a graduate course, to a retraining for a job. Hundreds. This hasn't seeped into our thinking that we are 10 decade churches and that faith formation is for a lifetime. And we all now exist, US and Canada, in a society where learning is for a lifetime. Second is we're five generational diversities. Okay, the names might be different, but I'll use these names and if, 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 there's, if there's a Canadian name you want to substitute, go ahead. But I think the names pretty much hold up. So, I'll start with the older ones. People born before 1946. Okay, you know who you are? We're happy you're still here. <laughs> the builder generation. In a sense, that generation built the institutions in society and government and the rest that, that we've all inherited. The boomers born between 46 and 60 or 64, after World War II, you know, the huge population growth, boom. Okay. They're now, well, in the United States, I'll give an example, 10,000 baby boomers in the United States turn 65 years old every single day. That's a lot of Medicare cards. 10,000 a day. Some of them are Catholic. On Sunday, you see a lot of them at church. And a lot of times we complain that our church has just got a lot of old people. Be careful. <laughs> Those old people are connected to all the other generations up there. More about that later. And then Generation X, I, don't, I think that would be common here. People born after the boomers, a little bit of a decline in the population, but early 60s to about 79. The people who get a lot of play, millennials, people in their 20s and 30s. Now, Generation X are no longer young adults. The oldest are, are like 55 years old. So I was doing a workshop and someone said, I'm a Generation X. He said, oh yeah, he said, I'm not a young adult. I want to be clear, I'm a grandparent. So the church is still trying to catch up to them, thinking they're young adults. They've moved way past that. They're not paying college tuition bills. Millennials in their 20s and 30s, they are becoming parents. So the parents of a lot of our kids between zero and 10 years old are millennial parents in their later 20s into their 30s. And we all know the millennial generation is huge, making an imprint on everything. And then the I generation or Generation Z, either, both names seem to get some play. Children born before, after 2000, their first year going to college will be this coming year. And they're different than the millennials. And they're really different than their grandparents. They've grown up in a totally digital world. The iPhone came out in 2007. They don't know a word be world before that. So if you really, really want to feel, feel old, put a black rotary dial phone and a typewriter on the table and do, uh, what do you think these things are? They're learning and interacting with the world very, very differently. I look at my own grandkids and think, there's just a lot of, there's ways in which they interact that are 21st century ways of interacting that even their parents are trying to catch up to them with. Okay, educators, educators are trying to catch up to this Generation Z. They're, because they have at their disposal every tool you need. If third graders ever got organized, they could take over the world. And we're just really grateful they're not organized. 
Every, every parish is a five-generation parish. How does faith formation respond to and adapt to the different generations? Because each generation has different approaches to institutions. So the builders built the institution. That's why we call them the builder generation. Okay. The boomers kind of push back a bit against them. But by the time you get to the millennials or Gen Z, who needs an institution? I have an iPhone. I build my own social network. I don't need somebody to do that for me. I can find whatever I want wherever I go. So relationship to institutions, relationship to authority is different. Family relationships are different. Even though, in fact, family relationships are actually better than they've ever been across the generations. Work-life balance. Some generations lived to work. If you're interacting with millennials entering the workplace, they work to live. Communication styles are different. Technology usage, very different. Their learning styles are different. The way they express themselves spiritually and the way they practice their faith or don't is different. And their worship styles are different. Every generation has a unique personality. It's not like developmental stages. They're more cultural, historical constructs. But they have a personality. And that personality means how do we respond to that differently? So every parish is not only 10 decades, every parish is five generational. Even though you may have more of one generation than others. Did I mention the one size fits all doesn't fit anymore? It's one size fits one. Family diversity. Think of all the family diversity just if not in the parish, just think about it in the community, okay? Now, even though I didn't grow up in a mom, dad, and two kids household, because grandma and grandpa lived on the third floor, so I grew up in an intergenerational household. Eh, we were Italian, we just got... Family life has never been mom, dad, and the two kids. It's always had more diversity, but today, diversity is the key word. So when we're thinking about how do we address parents and families, the question is, what kind of family, what kind of parents? And how do we, how do we address them where they are? Okay. So family life has changed. So again, if we have kind of a one-size first Eucharist preparation program for parents, which parents are you designing for? The parents who have been actively engaged, the, the, the married couple, and children, biological or blended, or are there other arrangements? What we know about families is, this is really fascinating, the diversity of family structures is one thing, but children between zero and 18 actually live in at least two different, on average, two different living arrangements between zero and 18. So it might be I live in a two-parent biological family, and or a single family, and or a blended family over those 18 years. So family structure, family life changes in those 18 years. There isn't necessarily a consistency from zero to 18 with one family form. You could have multiple family forms as kids are growing up in. One out of every six, I don't know the number for Canada, but one out of every six households in the U.S. is multi-generational. Grandma and grandpa have a parenting role, either primary or secondary. And that's only over the last 10 or 15 years. So that growth of the multi-generational household, that's always been true in ethnic communities. But now it's a kind of a societal characteristic. Very interesting. The pressures of work and finances. I did get the number, over 70% of Canadian moms work outside the home. The United States is about the same number, 70, 75%. The increasing complexity of family life, managing, balancing time and commitments. The busiest people on the planet are parents of children and teenagers. They're simply the busiest people on the planet as they manage family life, finances, time, commitments, their kids and the rest. The advent of new generation of parents, boomers are not parents anymore, well, they still are parents, but they're really grandparents. Millennial parents and young Gen Xer parents, I mean Gen Xers who are the younger group, are, the, are a generation of parents of children and teens. And their needs are different, their cultural outlook is different, their generational perspective is different. We also see among these younger families a decline in religious practice at home. 
we could look at the numbers, but you know, you kind of have a general sense of what that's like. And decline in participation, affiliation in churches, not just Roman Catholic, across the board. One of the things that's not talked about as a result of that, so the less contact that, that these generations have, the younger generations, the 40 and 45 and under, the less contact they have with religious communities, the less engagement they have and involvement in religious communities. Well, the decline in practice at home is something we rely on, don't we? There's a decline in faith transmission and practice at home. Very few churches I work with really emphasize faith formation with families with children zero to five or six years old. So by the time you get to grade one, it's remedial. You're trying to catch up on the first six years of faith formation, which did not happen in many homes. Because mom or dad or both left somewhere when they were in their 20s. And now they're parenting in that kind of absence. And so our older approaches of, you know, kind of the grade school, high school, whether it's parish or school, approach to faith formation is inadequate to the task because by the time they're five or six years old, they're not bringing much with them. They're not, they're not, they haven't been socialized, they haven't, haven't experienced faith practices at home, and constantly they come not with a lot of experience. And if you're doing parish work, especially when I work at parishes, you have very little contact with people. What do you get, an hour or two a week? On a good week? Not enough time to do religious socialization. Not enough time to do an immersion into, into, into Christian faith practices. But every, when I, especially when I talk about this in the States because we have so much parish-based religious ed because we don't have the same kind of school system you have here in, the, in, in, in Ontario. Um, Parishes have to do the majority of the work, but they still have a school kind of model of faith formation, weekly classes, you know, an hour a week, 24 hours to 30 hours on a really good year with no holidays, snow days, or vacations. Between what? Grade one and whenever you do confirmation. So I'll put it at 15, which is pretty typical. So you get about 10 years. So 10 times 24 240 hours. That's 10 days at home. So you see the dilemma. If there's not things going on in terms of faith transmission and practice at home, what does the parish have to work with or build on? So families have changed. The reality has changed. How do we adapt to the families? Because they're not going to change for us we have to be able to adapt to the new reality. And this is the lead into the spiritual religious. Now, I, I'll do this in a, this is the way I usually present this. So if you go right to left, you know the people who are the actives, right? You know these folks. The smaller the church, you know them by name, okay? So they're actively engaged. I mean, they, they, faith just guides their life. Their relationship with God permeates their life. Most couldn't think of their life without being a member of a faith community. So they're there on Sunday, they're engaged, they're involved. You know these folks. Even when the program you do is terrible, they still come back next week. <laughs> these are families who are sharing faith at home. Well, we do know by statistical numbers is this number, which used to be huge 60 years ago, has shrunk. Not just in Roman Catholic, but really across the board, all Christian churches. This group in purple has risen. I call them the occasionals. Okay. They're the pick and choose. Um, I'll come when it fits my schedule. Doesn't interfere with basketball, soccer, baseball, hockey, fill in the blank. Okay. So you might see them, now we're lucky we're Catholics and not like Baptists, because we have sacraments. And they do tend to turn out for a sacrament, especially like Eucharist, because you give away something for free. Um, take a while, think about it. Okay. So they come out for sacramental moments. And grandma and grandpa still have a kind of a role to play. Of course you'll get this child baptized. <laughs> or tomorrow I talk to the lawyer about our will. Okay. 
But faith is one engagement or involvement among many, where this is the center of life. Here, it's part of the juggling act. So the nice thing about a Catholic parish is you might see them 10 or 12 times a year. They'll definitely be there for Christmas, Ash Wednesday, and Easter. Palm Sunday, you know, the Mass is really long. You do the whole Passion, and then he dies at the end. What a downer. You know, come back to that. Too long. If you gave out palms when I walked in, I might be more interested. But if you give them as I'm walking out, you know, like, really? I've got to wait an hour and a half for palms? But you have touches with these folks. You have contact with them. You have a relationship, albeit not as much as people in red, but they are somewhat engaged. Now, the dilemma is oftentimes when you get to confirmation, you do it at what, seventh grade? Oftentimes, that's, the, that's what I call the great bargain, which is simply this. Confirmation is the last thing we're going to force you to do. So I'm not so much concerned that the children don't come back in grade 8 for faith formation. I'm concerned that you lose the whole family. So occasionals can be really occasional. But when you move into this area, the spiritual but not religious or the uninvolved, they're not hostile, they're not angry. It, you know, in many ways, in every way you look at them, they are Christian. They're just not engaged in any church community. For them, it's not important to be part of a community. So they may find an expression for in things in small communities, small groups, service, justice, personal spirituality, but they're not engaged in a faith community. The not spiritual, not religious, the unaffiliated are a fast-growing group. And that's the no religion group. They just don't think, it's not that they're angry or hostile, they're not, they don't, they don't, they're not upset with the church necessarily. It's just that religion has no place in their lives. Now, that's not, that's not a growing group among the 60 and over crowd. But it is a growing group in the 40 and under crowd. And so what's happening religiously is parents who are unaffiliated pass on unaffiliation. So actives pass on faith to their kids in faith practice and engage with the rest. But you know what? Unaffiliated pass on faith too, except that it's unaffiliated. So transmission's always happening. Kids are kind of big antenna dishes. And so it, they're always being engaged, either religiously or not religiously. So we have a lot of second generation unaffiliated. They're your children and teenagers who have grown up in homes where mom and dad and or dad simply stopped participating in church life. Maybe back when they were confirmed. Okay. Sure. Yeah, I don't have U.S. numbers, but Reginald Bibby gave me Canadian numbers. Okay. I actually have Canadian numbers. You know, so um, in his, it's his latest book, uh, Resilient Gods. This is not, by the way, light reading, nor is it necessarily uplifting reading. Um, pardon? I don't. This well, it's, it's it's only Canadians. I don't know if it's in French or not. I have the English version. So match these up. He's got three categories. So match them up a little bit and you'll see. So we know the embrace religion people, right? Pro-religious, they're involved, they pray, they read the Bible. In, these are like in big numbers, okay? They feel God cares about them, they feel God's presence. Like what's not to like? But they're 30%. Okay. Now this is all, this is all uh, religion, so it's not just Catholics. Okay, uh, he didn't, I couldn't find in the book where he just separated this out. Okay, so it's Canadians, period. The opposite end, it's almost even, huh? It's almost like a bell-shaped curve, so that the embrace and the reject religion are almost equal. Okay, so this is 26%. No religious, seldom or never participate, yet 50% identify with a religious tradition. So you hear this all the time. Well, I, I, when I do ecumenical work, I hear this all the time. People come up to me and say, 
are you still Catholic? I think so. <laughs> I said, who would have me at this point anyway? They said, I used to be Catholic. I meet a lot of used to be Catholics. It's fascinating. Who are now ministers, pastors in other, in other traditions. Okay, leaders in other traditions. That look, we're we're kind of like the, uh, you know, the uh, spring training. We get them ready for the big leagues, you know. Um, so what's really interesting is people still identify. They'll still name themselves as Catholic. But in fact, it, it's, it's, um, hmm. it's what I was socialized in, but it's not what's working for me now. And they, they built this wonderful whole community faith formation process that I worked with them over the last you know, year and a half. And one aspect of it is that every month would have a theme. Uh, they're a sermon-based church, I mean, a sermon series. So they take a theme like generosity or gratitude, and they do that the whole month. So they preach on it, they sing on it, et cetera. And then online, we built an online platform in which people can go deeper, adults, young adults, teenagers, and children on that theme. Something to learn, something to read, uh, something to, to watch, et cetera, that would dig deeper. So like every month is one of these themes of, Christian practices or virtues or qualities, et cetera. It's a great model. What the pastor started doing was he started developing podcasts of his sermon, not a recording of the sermon. He would, after he'd give the sermon, he would sit down and he would do it as a podcast, a different style, you know, not public, more personal. And he put those on the website. And so basically on Monday morning, it'd be available on the website. Well, a lot of people in Greenwich commute into Manhattan every day on the train. So for the three or four months, He's watching, people are downloading these podcasts, they're listening to it. And so when people gave him feedback, he said, well, how's this working for all you folks? He said, Pastor, we love these podcasts, but what do you got for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday? He said, listen to the whole podcast in the 30 minutes into work on Monday morning. What do you got for the rest of the week? He said, now we've got to start curating podcasts for the rest of the week. We can't create them, we're going to curate them because it's the ultimate portable resource. 20 minutes on a topic, listening to it with the earphones. So if you commute into New York, I mean, I, every now and then I go to New York City, you know, the morning commute, and I'm watching, nobody, everyone's got earplugs in. I'm thinking, he's, imagine this for a moment, just see, see the scale of this. If you just did three podcasts a week, just 20 minutes, that's an hour a week. That's four hours a month of adult faith formation. I'll take two months off in the summer, times 10 months, that's 40 hours of adult faith formation a year via podcasts. How many adults, how many, how many people in your church do you offer adult faith formation to that adds up to 40 hours? Could you ever get people to come to church for 40 hours of adult faith formation? He's doing it, and they're just commuting back and forth to work as part of their life. So what the digital allows you to do is not only personalize, but allows you to make it seamless. It's just part of life. We have a lot of different ways to learn. We can develop content in smaller units. I hate to say it, but the hour is dead. We're now thinking, what, 5, 10, 15-minute micro-learning chunks. Some of you are old enough to remember when, when YouTube videos were like 15 or 20 minutes long. Yeah, boy, they're in the archive, aren't they? How long is a typical YouTube video? Unless you're watching a TV show or the rest. About three minutes. Five is the kind of long YouTube video today. All right. Now, the flip side is people will sit down for 13 hours and watch a Netflix series without getting up. No dinner, no bathroom breaks, nothing. Just, all right. So you have both extremes, right? But by and large, people are doing what? They're accessing things in smaller chunks of time. The digital is perfect for what? Smaller chunks of time that you stitch together. We now have the content and tools to extend and expand anything we do at church. Worship can become a seven-day experience. If you do vacation Bible school or a big mission, you do a Lent, this church doing a Lenten mission program. You can bring that Lenten mission program to everybody in the church. You can extend it and deepen it. Maybe you get four hours at church, but maybe you can turn that four hours into 10 or 12 more hours at home, on your phone, on your tablet. We can do that. And what's going to happen is we really want to build community. 
but we find that we're not able to build communities very well. The digital world gives you a way to organize self-organizing communities of people with common interests who connect what? Through social media and digital. And that makes us way too in-person. So the digital offers you all these possibilities. Yeah, this is gonna work both ways. You're gonna meet some people in the digital world and invite them into the on-campus physical relationship. Right? Now, all of its relationships, so whether it's digitally mediated or you know, on-campus mediated, it's all relationships, okay? But what our interest is doing what? If we meet you in the digital world, we wanna invite you into, because we're not gonna do Sunday mass in the digital world, we want to invite you into our community. We gather every week. Um, we gather for events through the year and into physical relationships. Okay? So some people are meeting the digital and bring them into the physical. But other people start in the physical and we say, we don't have enough time with you. Like the best thing about Sunday worship is it's an hour. The worst thing about Sunday worship, it's an hour. So how do I take Sunday worship and extend it all week long into the digital world? So the, the portals are both sides. And as long as you keep the two connected so that whatever we do in the digital has some connection to what we do at church, and what we do at church has some connection to what we're doing digitally. If you can set up that, that's using the digital for faith formation. But we're not, I always talk about this as, this is just faith formation in a digital world as opposed to digital faith formation. It's always relationally mediated, even if those relationships start online. And with a lot of people, I think when we're thinking about missional outreach and evangelization today, we're thinking that maybe the digital is what we lead with. But we're going to invite, invite, invite into what? A small group. So I'm doing a Bible study, and I'm doing it online with people in a small meetup group. And we decide, wouldn't it be great if we got together at the local coffee shop every couple of weeks to talk about this? That's kind of the bottom-up self-organizing. We don't have time to organize people, and it's like herding cats. I mean, you can't organize people. All right. So we want, the, we, want the, we, want the, we want it to bubble up from below. So self-organizing communities, and that's exactly what's happening. If you look at what's happening in corporate training, in big corporations, that's exactly what's happening. It's micro-learning, just-in-time, and what happens is people who have the same need, interest, the rest, begin to gather together. So we have interest-based, we have life cycle-based, we have life transition-based, all that's possible. How you doing? Yes, but, but there is. And our goal is to, is, is to hold hold the two of them together. Not either or, but both and. The other thing we have to, I think we have to have a little reality check. Most of our big parishes are not communities. They're assemblies of people. Okay, so the church I go to back home, it's a couple of thousand people. That's not a community. So I go to 10 o'clock mass, I don't know the other people who go to the other masses. I never interact with them. I know people go Saturday night, but I don't know who they are. They could be zombies. I don't know. <laughs> so most of our parishes, unless you're 100 or 150 people, are not really communities. We're assemblies of communities. And so is there, is there a role for community relationships? In, oh, absolutely. And we want to hold that up while we still hold up the, the, the digital. Because people form community in digital spaces. And people form community in physical spaces. It's both true. If you can keep those connected, it's a both and world, then you can do faith formation in a digital world. But, it, but like, the, like the entrance point can't be, we only do things when we can gather physically and form community. Well, boy, it's gonna be a really small group. Given the, the whole size of our parish, it's gonna be a small percentage because that's always a fixed time. You know, it's the Wednesday night, 7.30 and 9 o'clock crowd. Okay, but once you set a time, you've excluded X number of people. 
who can't make Wednesday at 7.30 to 9 o'clock. So far, so good? Be able to address at least the three or four religious spiritual identities of people today, which is just going to call us to, to personalize and to target and be more inclusive. To address the decline in religious transmission and practice at home and the corresponding decline in participation in church life and programs. I think that's a one-two, by the way. I think the more we are able to help people at home, it's going to spill over into participation in church life. We've got to resist the temptation of short-term solutions of getting people back to Mass on Sunday. I watch the states, watch diocese spend millions of dollars on things like, you know, Catholics come back to Mass. There's a variety of these programs. And there are short-term fixes for big-time adaptive challenges. And so people do. They come back for five or six weeks. And they usually do it like around Lent. Well, if you're going to get people to come back to church, I mean, Lent's kind of like a no-brainer, right? I mean, do it in July and see how it works. You know, if it works in July, then maybe I'll change my attitude. But, you know. And then lastly, I think the digital culture presents opportunities. We have to learn how to use it. But I think the new technology and media create transformation in every aspect of life and give us new, media, new methods of engaging people and accessing great content. 